everybody, welcome back. Another exciting unboxing time in the new location. And we're trying out something a little bit new here. This is a proof of concept. This will only be around for a few videos. If it works, we'll get it out of the visual and make it work. But anyways, we are here to open up the October Horror Pack. Ooh. And of course it is Horror Pack, so Mary's not here because as you know, we've been spreading these videos out so we can kind of get things back onto being somewhat timely instead of way behind. Um, and this is one she's not terribly into. Although I do try to get her to watch at least one of the movies and review with me every time, so hopefully that'll keep up. If you want to check out Horror Pack, I have a link in the description below. It should get you some kind of discount at checkout. And basically you can choose DVDs or Blu-rays, and I think they're different movies, but they're going to send you generally four movies, sometimes five. Um, and they're going to be curated. There's always going to be one exclusive that at least at the time of release cannot be found anywhere else on the format. Every once in a while they even sneak in some 4K, which is great as well. Um, and it's a great way to kind of build up your horror movie collection. For me, because I have a collection of movies that's over 7,000 strong and grow and growing. I, uh, <laughs> including this 4K set coming soon. Um, I, uh, <laughs> I tend to have a lot of these movies. But what I like about this and doing it this way with y'all, because I'm going to review these movies, is that if I do have them, it's just a good excuse to go rewatch something that maybe I haven't watched in a while. So I very much appreciate doing all that. Now, I haven't decided if I'm still going to play the trailers while I talk about the movies or if we're just going to play the trailers over the reviews from now on. So I'm just going to fill that out as I get in here, because not having Mary here to, to talk off of, it's a lot harder to leave three minutes for each movie to play a trailer. But let's just jump right in here and let's see what we get. And we'll be jumping to this camera so you can, you know, see what we're looking at. So I'm going to go ahead and pull out the first movie. The first movie is... Ooh, Dead Dicks. Okay, I don't know anything about this one. And I do not have it, so that's cool. Looks like it could be a fun time. All right, well, here you go. Here is what it looks like. Oh, that looks good. Yeah, I really think this new way of doing things is going to work out very, very nicely. I can even, I even feel like I could show you the spine better. I can even do this. You can get a whole sense of the whole thing. And then we can go in close. And we can start, uh... No, actually, I guess you want to see what, uh, what we're looking at here, so... Okay. Yep, you get some special features and whatnot. And cool, multi-region. So this is, uh, brutally honest, startlingly insightful and poignant, says Richard Whitaker of the Austin Chronicle. An ingenious and imaginative slice of genre cinema, says Rob Aldama, Aldam of Backseat Mafia. A Cronenberg-inflicted science fiction piece, says UK Film Review. I don't know why all these reviewers have the same voice. Isn't that weird? Richie is a suicidal young man who, every time he kills himself, finds himself very much alive, but with a dead body of him in his apartment. His sister comes to the rescue, but as the bodies pile up, the pair think, that a vagina-like opening in Richie's bedroom might hold the answer. I'm sorry, did somebody write a movie specifically for me? Because I kind of feel like that's that's what just happened. That this is a movie that's specifically made for me. That sounds awesome and delightful, and I'm going to play the trailers during the reviews. I may even cut parts of the trailers out. Who knows, maybe it'll help with the copyright issue. So this uh, has a director's commentary, a behind-the-scenes featurette, plural, video diaries, Zoom, with cast and crew, so I guess they were putting these features together fairly recently. Uh, trailer and photo gallery. It's 83 minutes, so it's going to be super tight. And that looks like 2019, so not 2020, so maybe, yeah, I guess, okay, it could have been this year they were doing all that. Rated 18A, uh, must be British because it says color, <laughs> the proper pronunciation. Well, that sounds awesome. Art looks great. That sounds like I'm, that sounds like a good time. I'm behind on my movies, but I would watch this tonight if I didn't have to watch horror pack stuff from the last box. That's how far behind we are, but we're catching up. We're catching up. So now, real quick, I got to take a slight little peek at the spines, just because I want to make sure that's what I thought. I was just looking for the spine number, so I pull out the exclusive last. Next up, we have oh, oh, oh. This will be a good one to go back and rewatch. I do not have this version. We have the original Carrie, Brian De Palma's Carrie. Nice. We got the Blu-ray DVD combo pack going on with John Travolta. I don't know what that voice is supposed to be, but that's what I just did. I have not seen the original one in quite a while. Bone chilling classic based on a novel by Stephen King. Um, so it should be an interesting time. This might be one Mary will watch with me. That'd be curious. I think this is something she could probably handle and just in the sense that it's a classic, she might be interested in it. So. 
Uh, as all hell breaks loose when a tortured, misfit teenager, since he's basic, unleashes her secret telekinetic powers against her psychotic mother, Piper Laurie, and sadistic classmates. Based on the best-selling Stephen King novel, this ultimate revenge fantasy is one of the all-time great horror classics. An all-out, stops-out scare show, the Los Angeles Times. All right, right on. This has got some nice features, too. Um, acting Carrie Documentary with Sissy, Spake, Sissy Spacek, Amy Irving, Betty Buckley, and more. Visualizing Carrie Documentary with Brian De Palma and more. Carrie the Musical Featurette. Uh, yeah, if Mary watches this, she's going to want to watch that featurette. Animated Photo Gallery, Stephen King and the Evolution of Carrie Biography, and an original theatrical trailer. 1976, 98 tight minutes, and um, should be a good time. Plus, I mean, it's Brian De Palma, so in his heyday, too, so. Very cool. I'm sure I own some version of this movie, um, but I'm excited to check that out. It's a good reason to rewatch something I haven't seen in a long time. And I certainly don't own that one, and as a movie collector, I don't mind having various releases of things. It's just kind of nice. All right, last of the non-exclusives we've got, ooh. I definitely have this, but I'm definitely ready to rewatch this. We have Lights Out from producer James Wan, the director of The Conjuring, and David F. Sandberg is the writer. Yeah. Okay, this was really, really good. It's, it's not exactly what I was thinking it was initially, but this one's still really, really good. There's a lot of good stuff going on here based on that really cool uh, short film like the monster shows up in the dark and then they turn on the lights and it's closer and they turn them off and all that kind of stuff. Just a really good time. This one's PG-13. I wonder if Mary would watch this one. Maybe we'll get her in two reviews. I don't know. We got a couple of options here. So there's that at least. Okay, there's the back of the box. It's a tight little short run time too. So we have a horror gem, says Scott Mendelson of Forbes.com. Growing up, Rebecca never knew what lay behind the terror lurking in the dark. When she left home, she thought she'd also left her fears behind. Now her little brother, Martin, is, Martin, 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 is experiencing the same unexplained and terrifying events that once tested her sanity. A supernatural entity with a connection to their mother's past is haunting them. And as Rebecca gets closer to discovering the truth, her life and the lives of those around her are in danger. Once the lights go out in Georgia, I, is that how that song goes? <laughs> That's the night that the lights went out in Georgia. Yeah, okay, cool. I got a good reference. Special features include deleted scenes. That's it. What else do you want? Um, <laughs> PG-13, 81 minutes. Yeah, that's going to be a good rewatch. So... Definitely have two out of four of these. Although again, Carrie, I definitely don't have that version. So this is the only thing that's gonna be a definite duplicate for me, but that's okay. I'll, I'll be excited to watch it. And maybe we'll get Mary to watch it and we'll put it in the review section. <clears throat> so before we get to the reviews, let's see what the exclusive is. Man, I have to admit the exclusives lately have been, they've not been great. <laughs> they've not been terrible, but they've not been great. We're due for a really good one in here. Also now we play the game of will the box art be professional or not. <laughs> Here we go, horror pack. We get, ooh, oh, <gasps> crap, do I have this? Or do I have part two? I don't have this version. Okay, this I'm excited for. This might be, oh, and it, you know, it looks pretty good. We have The Barn, horror pack limited edition Blu-ray. I think I met these people at a convention. I kind of want to go around the corner and look. I'll do that when we go, when we cut to reviews. So here is this gorgeous artwork. That is gorgeous. This movie, I remember this looks like fun. I'm looking forward to this. This is gonna be a good time. It is Horror Pack release number 52. I think we finally got us a good one here. Let me give you a look at that like that so you can kind of see it. Then we'll get up here and get close if you really wanna take. Yeah, see, I really like this hybrid top-down camera and face camera. And basically what we'll do in the future is I will rig a C-stand higher up out of the camera frame, put an SLR with a zoom lens on it and a little monitor down by the table. And that way we can have this here, not in the frame, and get great quality. So anyways, let me tell you about The Barn. The Barn is a love letter to everything that there is to love and fear on Halloween, says Brad Slayton, uh, Tom Holland's Terror Time. A must-watch midnight movie, says Derek Anderson of The Daily Dead. An undeniably fun 80s horror throwback, says Mark L. Miller of Ain't It Cool News. All kinds of scary things are waiting in The Barn, says Michael Gingold of Fangoria. Dread Central's Top 5 Best Horror Films of 2016. It's Halloween 1989. Best friends Sam and Josh, Mitchell Mussolino and Will Stout, are trying to enjoy their last Devil's Night before graduating high school. 
trouble soon arises when the two pals and a group of friends, Lexi Drips, Cortland Woodward, Nikki Darling, and Nikolaus Joshua, take a detour on their way to a rock concert, finding an old abandoned barn and awakening the evil inside, the Boogeyman, Hollow Jack, and the Candy Corn Scarecrow. Now it's up to Sam and Josh to find a way to protect their friends and defeat the creatures that lurk within the bar. Featuring appearances by Scream Queen, Linnea Quigley, Night of the Demons and Return of the Living Dead, and Sorority Babes in the Slime Bubble already. And Ari Lehman, Jason Voorhees from Friday the 13th. Ari's a fun dude, Ari is a fun party dude, but I mean, come on, man. He, I appreciate how much he milks his uh, convention celebrity. He, he was the kid Jason that jumps out of the water, if you aren't familiar. So he was Jason Voorhees of Friday the 13th. It's true, can't deny it. Um, it is actually very charming, he's, he's a fun dude. Uh, with a killer originally score by, score by Rocky Gray. Does not seem to be any special features in here, at least they are not listed. Um, looking for runtime. 80 minutes, so nice and tight. Good, good, good. And uh, yeah, I think this is gonna be real. Actually, I'm looking forward to watching all four of these. So th this is a really, this is a strong horror pack, which makes sense, it's October. But uh, before we wrap this up, let's get to the reviews. Okay, so, let's do it like this. All right, so, Dead Dicks. Um, eh, kind of disappointing. Uh, it's great in its concept. The concept is fantastic, um, but the execution is a little underdone, a little undercooked for me. It's just, the bulk of the movie is two people quiet talking in one location. Um, so, it, and you know, I don't feel like they take the concept as far as I would have liked them to necessarily take it. We do have a third character in kind of a, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, he's not a total jerk. I mean, he's, he's somewhat right in his uh, aggravation with the neighbors, but <laughs> I mean, you know, he's maybe, maybe a little tiny douchey, but not terribly. And I do think he's an interesting addition to this. And having him in there does actually bring some more energy in those scenes. Uh, and there's some really cool stuff that does go down with that character. But again, like a lot of this movie, I think I just wanted more from it. I wanted more exploration into the strangeness of what's happening. Um, I would have liked it maybe to have gone somewhere a little bit more than it did. It's almost, it's not terribly predictable, but it's a tiny bit predictable by the end. Uh, you know, just heads up if you're gonna check it out, heads up. There's a lot of full frontal male nudity in this. Um, I mean, I don't care, it's fine. I'm just saying, some people you might be shocked by that, so <laughs> just be aware that Dead Dicks plays into the title. Also, the character's name is Dick, so there is that. Um, I mean, the performances were fine. They didn't really bother me or anything. It wasn't anything like that. It, it is 83 minutes, but it feels closer to two hours. I don't know, it just kinda, it's kinda slow and kinda draggy, which kinda turns me off to it because I did think the concept is really pretty brilliant, and it is definitely something worth uh, searching into. But I can't say that the characters are all that likable. I think that's also part of the problem, um, especially our main character, the brother. He's He is a dick. Too. So that, I guess that's another layer of dead dicks in this movie. Um, the opening sequence under the credits is pretty brilliant too because it's actually quite unnerving and makes you very uncomfortable. Uh, and I would have liked to have maybe played a little bit more with that as well, get some more of that going. I think it just never really got to the levels of craziness or brutality or darkness that I was kind of hoping to find in the movie. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really kind of all I've got. Uh, it's there's a touch of body horror in here, but it's not as much as they really could have gone with it. There's a hint of sort of a Lovecraftian vibe in here, but again, not as far as they could have gone with it. I feel like it's a it's like a it's like a really subtle dish, you know. It's like it's all subtle flavors in there, but the concept calls for like strong flavors. To me, I don't know. That, that's the best way I can put it. But that's kind of how I feel about Dead Dicks. I was just disappointed. I think I think I would watch this again in time, and perhaps with my expectations more in check of what I should be getting, I might enjoy this more than I did the first viewing. But on my first viewing, it was just kind of a little bit dull and a little bit disappointing. But still, there's a lot of greatness to be found in here. So it's a good it's a good addition to Horror Pack. It just it reads better on the box than it came across to me. I think that's probably part of it. But you know, it is what it is. Um, and I guess, I don't know if this was made during pandemic or not. It theoretically could have been with such a small cast in there, so. All right, well that's my thoughts on Dead Dicks. Uh, let's talk about another movie. 
All right, so we just watched Carrie. <laughs> um, so I, I've seen at least most of this. But having said that I watch it, I'm not sure I've actually ever seen the whole thing in one setting. I have to have. Maybe it's been like 30 years. Um, but I have to have. Because uh, I do remember almost all the moments in this. However, everything does play out and unfold a little bit different here and there than I thought. And I certainly got some more subtext and different meanings than I have since I last really thought about the film. Um, it still really holds up. It's still really well done with a few weird cheesy moments. I'm gonna have to get a little spoilery here. I'll try to save that near the end in case you've never seen the original Carrie. Um, it's a fairly simplistic tale. Her crazy mother is great at being crazy. It's a simpler time in the 70s. Debbie Does Dallas is shooting at the school next door. <laughs> sorry, but I'm sorry, but the opening of this reminds me a lot of the opening of Debbie Does Dallas. They even have the same penis shaped shower heads. So, and then I was like, oh Jesus, there is a locker room full of naked girls that are, wait, supposed to, they're seniors. I'm gonna assume they're 18, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I thought, anyways, that aside, how you even had John Travolta looking like a young uh, Ron Jeremy. <laughs> um, anyways, <laughs> so. It opens pretty good, you know, with that classic scene about plug it up, plug it up and all that and like the torment and the trauma there. I forgot PJ Souls was in this. That was a welcome addition, even though she's a bitch in this. She's like bitchier than the psycho lead bitch girl because she's just like maniacally laughing and thinks everything is incredibly silly. Um, but it's always good to see her. The rest of the cast feels real good. Apparently you could just punch the shit out of your students a lot back then, because that happened. That, that coach, that female coach was very slap happy through this movie, so that kind of got me giggling. William Cat was great, even though his hair is bigger than his ego for the greatest American hero. I don't know why I said that. I don't know that that man has an ego. I just wanted to make a big hair joke, but um, it was really fun seeing him. And he's sweet and genuine in this, as is kind of the other girl that feels bad and sends Carrie to the prom. It would have been interesting if it had been a twist and they weren't, well, okay, spoilers, I guess, although that's not really like something they're trying to trick you with in the movie, but uh, it would have been kind of interesting to uh, have it turn out that they were in on it the whole time, like it just uh, subvert your expectations, that'd be kind of cool. Well, the pacing is pretty good, especially for a 70s film. We do get to the prom a lot sooner than I thought, and there's a lot more after the prom than I remember there being. Um, it's not nearly as psychotic and violent as I remember. Like, the filmmaking of it's very good, and Carrie, Sissy Spacek's performance is fantastic, especially when she goes full-on psycho with her abilities and stuff, um, and, like, the shift to the red lighting and all of that. And I thought there would be more De Palma-isms of the era in his filmmaking in here than there are. I thought there was more use of split-screen and crazy colors than there really is, but it is a pretty gorgeous sequence that still holds up to this day. There was one very strange... Uh, filmmaking choice they made though um, when the guys are all going to get their tuxes and there's one line where it's like there's a line from William Cat and a line from the shorter guy where they just speed it up into chipmunk speak like and then slow it back down to get the next punchline and obviously I'm guessing that's a pacing rhythmic thing but it felt so weird and out of character um, I actually made me took me out of the movie a little bit made me think do I have a weird copy <laughs> I don't think so I think that was just his stylistic thing um, what else before I get to the things I really want to discuss here because uh, I really want to talk about the ends but I want to get all that out of the way in case you want to skip forward um, yeah the girls are bitchy bitchy I will say you know because obviously it's a story of Carrie getting her revenge and whatnot and um, it's it's a little unsatisfying I think the remake might actually have have the movie be better in ter just in one era not, not the whole way through but because it's been forever since I've seen the remake too but just in the area of if I recall um, the murders, the deaths, Carrie's vengeance is more satisfying than it is in here, especially in this movie against the lead chick and John Travolta. It's kind of cool, uh, it, even though the lead chick looks like she's suddenly in the Toxic Avenger trying to run over a kid for points in the car. <laughs> like, there's something about her motivation, like, I would like to have played more into her and learned more about why she is so goddamn psychotic. Um... But yeah, that the, she was just gonna do that with the car and everything. But then it's a like it's a deserved, it's a justice, it's a good, it's a good ending for those characters. It's just underwhelming. I want, I would have liked to had more. I think uh, we deserved more. They deserved us getting to enjoy it more. Not that I would want that in real life, but that's part of the catharsis of watching movies like this is seeing that deserved justice served. 
That said, um, with the ending, so if you haven't seen it, I am going to spoil this a little bit. I'm going to talk about this ending because it's different than I remember it being. So you might want to pop out now. Here's your warning. Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. So at the end, I always remembered it as like Carrie fighting her mom, which is really disturbing, that whole scene, and even Jesusing her mom, and then hiding in the closet where their Jesus statue looks like Weird Al Yankovic. Um, <laughs> but in my brain, I always had it as Carrie goes so batshit, she collapses their house in on them. But watching this time, it's made very clear that's not the case. She's unconscious through most of this. And, like, it's happening and she seems to not want it to happen. I mean, I guess it could, I guess it's been to, meant to be one of those things that's, like, open to interpretation. Like, maybe it is her, it's her subconscious guilt at herself and her rage at her mother. Or maybe there is, like, the, I can't believe Stephen King would ever say that the mom was right and religion was, you know, doing what it's doing. But, um, so I thought that was kind of interesting that I always remembered that being quite different than it was. And, and being more spectacular than it was. The, the effects were good, what we got, but in my brain, I always remember more to that whole collapsing house than there is. And um, then I never really realized that classic jump scare at the very end, that um, it's not very effective by today's standards, but maybe it's because we all know it's coming. But I never noticed so clearly before that that is a dream in the beginning. Obviously, they tell you it's a dream by the end of it, which is also an interesting choice. Instead of doing what I'm used to with the 80s tropes of sequel setups, um, that they really were saying, no, now all this psychological trauma has manifested differently into this other young lady who was just really trying to do the right thing, but she had been too caught up with the wrong people for too long, um, and it just ended up catching up to her. So... So kind of fascinating, kind of interesting, and I mean that trauma too of like everybody you knew, everybody in your world except your mom and dad are just gone. Everybody. And you could make an argument that it's your fault. Granted, I would not argue that it's her fault, but you could make that argument. So that's traumatic in its own right. I also do love how the movie with Carrie um, kind of, after her rampage, uh, she kind of ends where she begins in the movie with the blood and the bathing and whatnot. So I thought that was a nice little touch. So there's some really great filmmaking in here. There's some filmmaking you can tell he's kind of learning or trying some things and some of the stuff doesn't work. Performances are great all the way around. Music is very Bernard Herrmann and Psycho. This kind of feels like, and some of these references are gonna be before this movie, some of these references are after the movie, but I definitely got shades of things like Sam Raimi's work on Evil Dead. Um, and of course, very much Hitchcock. De Palma's definitely going for Hitchcock here. Hitchcock doing a Stephen King story. But I think as far as, I don't know how it translates, I've never read the book or the short or whatever it's based on with Stephen King, so I don't know how good of a translation it is. But as far as movies based on his works, I think this is one of the stronger ones, just through and through, very, very solid. And uh, really glad I had a chance to watch it. So again, you know, so another good, another good job there, Horror Pack. So uh, don't worry, I'm not gonna use my telekinesis and send my wrath, y'all y'all good. So <laughs> that's my thoughts anyways on Carrie. So let's go to the next movie. Okay, uh, Mary, myself, and Ms. Tabitha, and actually uh, our man Napoleon, he's gone. We just watched uh, Lights Out. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> he's trying to lure him back over. It's James Wan produced. It's actually pretty good. There, there's some definite issues with it. I kind of was like, oh, we'll watch this one. It'll be a fun one. We can kind of crap all over. And it's like, well, actually, I, I, I don't remember liking it that much, but it's good. It's got problems. It could be better. So mostly, what are your thoughts? Um, <laughs> your first viewing. It's... Oh, sorry. I, I, I will say we can talk some mild spoilers here. Like, don't give away exactly mm -hmm. how it ends or anything like that or any major twists, but well, the major... little details we can I think the major but... flaw is that, is that characters tend to figure out how this works pretty quickly, the, the rules, so to speak. Right. And they still do stupid shit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like they still act like they don't know this thing's real. Like they, they they see it, they agree, oh, it's a real thing. And then immediately for a bunch of scenes after, they're like, eh, whatever, it's not a real thing. Or, eh, oh, the light saves us. Hey, you know what, let me uh, walk in this dark room and not turn even turn on a light switch. Or, you Dude. know, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I would agree with things <laughs> like that. Um, I don't know. <sighs> Now, mind you, I also the it's a it's a very jump scare type of movie, and they are really telegraphed. Yeah, yeah, it's not like the Conjuring. There, there were <laughs> no jump scares that didn't catch me off guard. And I'd be like, "Oh, jump scares coming! I'm just gonna sit here." Honestly, honestly, uh, the the biggest jump scare, and it's subtle, but um, it's early in the movie um, when there's a cut, like a 
from one scene to another and it's like her dropping a box full of paperwork on a, on a table. <laughs> like that's the one you least see coming that makes you jump a little bit. <laughs> you know? Even yeah. you jumped there. Um, yeah, so there's that. One of the things that really stood out with me, again, other than the, kind of the stupidity of the characters and how obvious and telegraphed everything in this really is, because Mary really predicted the hell out of it. Hey, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, she wants to be in the video. Um, oh, kitty break. <laughs> She's a talky one. Um, there was a moment near... In the climax, like, fighting the monster, so I'm only going to say a specific about... You know, I'm not. Don't worry. This is not a spoiler. <laughs> um, like the rules don't always make sense. Like with the monster, you know, you put light on the monster, the monster disappears. Um, so, so there's one moment. <laughs> so I, just, I was doing that. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> there was one moment um, where then she shines. Like she gets the arm pinned of the monster, and she shines a flashlight on the monster, and the arm slowly burns. But I'm like, no, no, they did explain that. Did they? Yeah, it's a combination of the black light. And the regular light. Well, no, 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 like, okay, so, so the black light. There is a black light. I like what they did with that, but no, 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 no. Like, I'm saying, usually if light hits her, she disappears. But she's... No, the, they, could, they could spot where she is with the black light, but they still need a regular light to fight her and make... Okay, okay. well... Okay. They, okay. Oh, spoilers. Well, hold on. <laughs> we've, we've already said spoilers, but actually, I think you're, what you're saying is not wrong. Um, I guess the burning part did happen, but it doesn't make mm -hmm. sense to me why. They're not, because they didn't actually say the combination of the black light and regular light will hold her um, still, because there were other light no, no, things no, that no, made her disappear, even though the black light was there. Apparently, no, apparently the black light makes her corporeal. See, I didn't get that. I mean, maybe it, I, it, I, I'm going to assume you're right because you're always right. Because that, that then she actually right. looked like she had a body rather than just being a shadow. Yeah, but it's also sort of light to be able to see the monster. I, I don't know. But, I'm not going to die on this but, hill, but, so it still it but, bothered but, me. But the thing is, when she the first when she encountered the first time she encountered with the black light, and then the kid showed up with the regular flashlight, she burned that time too. Right, but that doesn't. I guess I guess, it, I guess maybe it wasn't as as proclaimed because what you got out of it sounds right, but it wasn't that proclaimed to me. So plus, I just explained. explained. <laughs> it's late, and there's there's a distracting kitty, and my arm is getting tired. Um, I think it definitely works better as a short. I think there's a cr great visuals. There's some really creepy imagery and stuff in this. Maria Bello is fantastic in it, um, and it is different in in a sense that it's like not like. There are parts that I like that they do something different with the story than what you would think of a movie of this era. But then there are parts where it's like, oh, wow, you're really hitting the cliches. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily like that. So, I mean, again, I don't hate this movie at all. Um, and I was happy re-watching it. I just, but this, again, is one of those things where it's like, I really want to hear what they tell the police at the end. That's a good point. Yeah, we don't we don't have to tell you anything about how it happens at the end. But, you know, with with the, uh, how, how do you explain this away? Mm -hmm. You know, like, however it, however it resolves... How do you explain it away? It's very interesting. Uh, one other nitpick that annoys the hell out of me. Uh, this is a mild spoiler earlier. Um, when the the one, and again, I'm going to say this in a way that keeps it a little less spoily too, just in case. But when the one lady with some authority um, is checking out the, the, the sister's apartment and she's like judging her capability with a child. And at first she's like looking at these like heavy metal posters and like giving the eye of, yeah, and she's, supposed, she's not supposed to be one of those stereotype old women. It's like, oh, metal's evil. But you get that vibe that she's like, oh, you wouldn't be fit because look at all these heavy metal posters up here. And in my brain, I'm like, it's like, even even this is like 20,000, 20, uh, you know, it's like the 2010s somewhere. So it's modern enough that there are a lot of heavy metal parents out there. But... I can't argue when she then looks over and sees the like 10 foot bong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I was like, ah. although my brain wanted to be like, well, it's probably legal in that state, but maybe not when this movie happens. <laughs> of course, I'm sitting here going like, given what this kids have been dealing with, some of the imagery on these posters might be a little PSTD. But... Right, but then there's also the whole thing that like, this is like the night after the sister helps the kid for the first time. Yeah. It's like, this was all thrown on her. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, if I'd had a little more notice, maybe I would have taken these down in, in those regards or whatever. Yeah. But it's like, you're judging a little too quick and too soon. 
Um, you know, but performances are fine, kid performances are fine, pacing's fine. It's kind of quiet and slow because it's all about quiet and then bam, super loud. That's Mary's thoughts. <laughs> but uh, yeah, all right, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's not terrible. It's not great. It's not. It's not really super memorable either, because I couldn't remember a lot of it. Yeah. You know, I, I'm watching. I'm like, oh yeah, that happened. I, I find oh, yeah, it happened. meh. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I I think again the concept took it for me, and some of the performances took it a little bit further for me than you, but could, it could have been. It could have been more. <laughs> you should have closed in on Tabitha. Well, it's still rolling. We can do that if we didn't make everybody <laughs> sick. Hey, Tabitha. What did you think of the movie? It stinks. <laughs> All right. Next movie. So, The Barn. The Barn. I watched it last night. It was too late for me to fill my review. First and foremost, I will say I thoroughly enjoyed The Barn. It ain't perfect by any means. Um, there's a lot of potential in it that doesn't go as far as I would have liked it to. There's some definite budgetary restraints that are a little unfortunate. Definitely my biggest takeaway is it's a movie where I wish they had had more to work with so they could have done more with it. Um, I do love all the homages. I love the tone, the spirit, the cinematography, the look of it, um, the way they did make it really look and feel like an 80s film. Um, I do think they had some bad acting that was like intentionally bad like oh we're trying to be like bad 80s acting and definitely some dialogue that was written like it's trying to be bad 80s dialogue and i think that's a failure i think it didn't need to be perfect acting or perfect dialogue but they really should have not intentionally written it to feel that way um i think that's a little bit of a problem i had for sure with it sorry uh there we go um but <laughs> but um Again, kind of a minor takeaway. I think that's gonna bother a lot more people than it bothers me. But I love the overall story. I love the flow. I think the pacing was really good. Um, it could be really creepy. This is something I would have loved to have seen as like a kid. I think the villain characters, like the monster, the killer characters are great. Um, there's a little bit more going on there I think is pretty nice. I like the kind of creep show elements they're pulling with some of the animated like artwork, like almost comic book panels kind of thing they do. Um, I think the characters, while being kind of certain stereotypes, absolutely, totally work, again, for what they're doing. I appreciate the one bit of gratuitous nudity being obviously gratuitous, like they were winking with, hey, here's some gratuitous nudity, that's clearly a body double, much like you would see in the 80s, but maybe you wouldn't have noticed. <laughs> so I think things like that were really, really fun. Um, certainly something I'd love to see a sequel to. I would absolutely watch more of this. This is something I would revisit on Halloween. I think it totally fits into that kind of Halloween vibe. I don't mean Michael Myers Halloween, I just mean Halloween in general. Um, it would be like a good start off to like a triple feature that includes Halloween and, and Trick or Treat maybe. Or maybe even Creep Show and Trick or Treat, I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, it's really good and the soundtrack really works. The soundtrack really feels like it's an 80s film soundtrack and it would have been one of the best of the era. And, excuse me, I do mean not just the actual soundtrack, like the rock and roll songs, but also the film score element, the synth score. So I think that's pretty standout and phenomenal in this. Uh, this is something I like enough, I would buy some merch from. I would totally get a t-shirt, I'd buy the soundtrack. I'm excited to own the two versions of the Blu-ray and have all these special editions and special features. Pretty sure it's the same Blu-ray disc as the one I own, as it did not have the horror pack logo and stuff as the uh, exclusives tend to, do, tend to have now. Uh, uh, <laughs> Linnea Quigley was pretty cool in this, you know, definitely playing against type. She was kind of fun. You could tell she was having a good time with it. Ari Lehman was actually really great in this. I love what they did with him, and honestly, maybe that dude does need to do a horror hosting metal show or something, because in this character they created for him, which is very much like him, it totally works, and I watched the hell out of that. So again, maybe the filmmakers will do a connected universe and we'll get more of that in other films they make. I think that could be pretty fantastic. But yeah, no, I had a really good time with The Barn and it was late and I was tired, but stayed wide awake and engaged. I think the acting again is very inconsistent, but that fits with a tone like this, like with what they're going for, like kind of this, this hidden rediscovered 80s gem. Um, it, it, you know, th those kind of inconsistencies absolutely actually add to the flavor of it, but I don't think those were done on purpose. I do think that's where it hurts itself, is when it tries to feel like an 80s movie is a little too much in those regards, like, 
oh, we'll do some of the bad things of 80s movies on purpose instead of just making a really good movie that feels like a lost gem of the 80s. I also, even though I love the monstrous villain killers, um, I think one of them they do a lot with, and it's really, really cool, and they set up some great potential, especially if they could have had more money and did a bigger sequel. The other two, while still very interesting and totally fitting within the tone of the movie, they are a little undercooked. They don't really get their moments to shine, and they feel a little bit more generic, particularly compared to the one they do spend a little more time and effort on, and uh, who should have been like the lower tier of the three. So I think that's a little inconsistent as well. But again, most of my complaints are pretty minor. I can see some people disliking this movie movie a lot more than I did. Um, I ultimately really, really liked it and it held up and I'm excited about it. So thank you Horror Pack, that was a great pick. It's perfect for this box and I'm excited to check that one out time and time again. Plus sweet ass alternate art. So <laughs> very good job. Okay, uh, that's the last of these movies, right? Cool, it's the first one I watched this month, but last of the movies. So I think I'm gonna watch something else tonight. Yay. Okay, well hopefully those were a good time. Hopefully we enjoyed it. And yes, I do have the barn, but you know what? And this actually feels kind of good to say for Horror Pack's sake. Hopefully I will remember to cut to this. Here is the Horror Pack cover art. Beautiful, awesome. Here's the one I bought at the convention. Not nearly as nice. Still not bad, but not nearly as nice. There's the backs. The backs are identical-ish. Oh, mine has 90 minutes of special features. I bet you those are included on here and they're just not listed. That's gonna be my guess. But um, yeah, very, very cool. So at least again, collectible because collectible, limited edition. I'm a happy camper. So there you go, that is Horror Pack for October 2020. What do you think? Which of these movies are your favorite? Have you seen The Barn? Which version do you have? I think there's a sequel or they're making a sequel. Let me know, geek out with us in the comments. We'd love to hear what you have to say around here. Other than that, you can click the thumbs up button and give us that good old spooky thumb of encouragement as we do love to be encouraged. You want more movie reviews? You want vlogs, food stuff, lots of video game let's plays, horror games a lot of the time? You can check out our Patreon. It's a dollar a month. You get an extra video every single day. You can go to Patreon, look up the Eric Butts, or you can use my Patreon link in the description below. If you want to check that out, come be a Patreon peep. Let's talk about some movies and stuff. All right, all that said and done, though, I'm done. I got movies to watch. I got things I got to go do, so I'm going to do them. We're going to get out of here, watch some more stuff. I'll see you all later.